Right, so principles of INS. What we're going to cover today is how an INS works and what we use them for. Uh, appreciate why we need to aid an INS with other sensors. And then we're going to look at the effects of other sensors on INS performance, as well as the, the effect of an INS on other sensors performance, which is, which is uh, the, the, the reverse of it or the vice versa of that. Okay. So first of all, what is an INS? Anybody tell me, put it into the chat or put it onto the screen. There is an obvious answer because it is an acronym. So what is an INS? Anybody tell me. National Navigation System, excellent stuff. Thanks, Adrian, good stuff. National Navigation System, okay. Right, so that's the, that's the acronym de dealt with. What does it do? Can anybody tell me what it does in a couple of, you know, a couple of words, just, just tell me what they think an INS does. Clear those ones down. National Navigation System, I can see in the chat as well. Thanks for that, guys. But what does it do? Underwater positioning, to a certain degree, yes. Aids subsea navigation in absence of GPS, excellent. Gives the orientation and position of the vehicle. It certainly does. All these add up into, into what an INS does. Any other answers? No. Precise 3D special relative positioning. Okay, yeah. One way of writing it, but yeah, definitely. Inbuilt gyro, Joby's put into the chat. Real time heading pitch and roll. It's yeah, that comes into it, but it's a bit more than that actually. It's a bit more a bit more involved than just real time heading pitch and roll, but you certainly get that information from the system. Okay, good. Some good answers there. Dead reckoning, Asa. That's the words I was looking for. Gold star to Asa. So dead reckoning. Okay. Before we go on with what an INS actually is and what it does, um, it may uh, it, it's usually good to put it into context straight away. So what we've got on the screen here is a, is a commercial airliner. Um, these systems are used in commercial aircraft to to to, to, to circumnavigate the globe. Obviously, at this particular moment in time, there aren't many of them up in the sky, but, but when they do eventually uh, start to start to fly again, they will all be using inertial systems in order to navigate themselves across the oceans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, the actual definition for an INS, just so you're aware, is uh, it calculates the position of a body based on knowledge of a previous position and subsequent movement from that position. Okay, so somebody said it earlier, Acer said dead reckoning. So that is basically what dead reckoning is. You give something a starting location uh, and then we, we utilize information available to us from that starting location in order to predict our next positions in time. Okay. So dead reckoning we've talked about. Dead reckoning actually comes from uh, you know, more of a maritime industry type uh, scenario where you've got a surface vessel and usually a surface vessel would be traveling at a constant heading and usually a constant velocity. Okay, so it's very easy. Once you've got an initial position for your surface vessel, it's very easy to predict your next position in time because you've got a constant heading and constant velocity. But obviously we're not interested in that because we at Sonodyne are a subsea positioning company. So we are positioning ROVs, as you can see on the screen there, AUVs and, and subsea vehicles of all sorts uh, of shapes and sizes these days. So particularly ROVs, do they travel on a constant heading and a constant velocity? Question. Put it into the participants tab if you want, just put thumbs up or a thumbs down or across, or just put yes or no into the chat. Do they travel on a constant heading or a constant velocity, usually? Steve says no, good stuff. Teja Swinney says no. Ashith, thank you, yeah. They go wherever they want, they do. Thanks Simon, yeah. 
depending on the pilot. Yeah, so lots and lots of heading maneuvers, lots and lots of um, upwards and downwards movement as well, don't forget. Uh, and very rarely do they travel at the same velocity unless they're doing some kind of survey run where, where they're trying to maintain the same velocity. Okay, so we obviously need, uh, from, a, from a positioning perspective, in order to predict our next positions in time, we need to know real-time information about how that vehicle is moving. Okay, in terms of velocity, heading changes, pitch and roll changes, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, but we need to measure the real time changes in velocity and attitude in order to update our position estimations. So, how do we do it? Anybody tell me, what do we use in order to, 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 to maintain these, these changes in velocity and attitude? Anybody tell me? into the chat or onto the screen if you want. There's some systems that we utilize in order to get this information. Any takers? AHAS system and SVS, yep, certainly comes into it. Motion sensors and a gyro. Steve says accelerometers, good stuff. Ejiswani says DVL. Proessa says GPS, potentially, yeah. If we're at the surface, we could utilize a G GPS or GNSS. Accelerometers, good stuff. So we've got gyros and accelerometers. So what have we actually got? Exactly right. We've got three ring laser gyros and three accelerometers in this particular case. Okay. So I'll come on to why we use ring laser gyros in a minute, but basically we've got one ring laser gyro for each axis or each orthog uh, orthogonal axis. And then we've got three accelerometers, so one for each axis. Okay, so on the, uh, on the picture in the middle here, you can see this is an older system, uh, but the principle is the same. We've got two gyros here. We would prob probably have a third gyro on the underside of this, this particular uh, cube formation. And then the accelerometers over here would make up the other sides to this cube. Okay, so there'd be a, a sensor for each axis, which allows us to measure, uh, you know, take gyro readings for each axis as well as accelerations for each axis. So the reason we use uh, Sonodyne is, is why we use ring laser gyros is, is uh, because their stability um, is, is very good uh, almost straight away once you power these things up. Whereas, uh, the, the other type of gyro on the market, the fiber optic gyro, which you sometimes see in these systems, is uh, more susceptible to temperature change and vibration. And so that requires a, a little bit of a um, calibration, if you like, in order to get them to be, uh, to read sensibly from, from the off. So the ring laser gyros are much more stable to start off with. So that's, that's kind of why we use them. They're also used in commercial airliners, as, as, as I said earlier. So they're proven technology. They're, they're built to last, which means, you know, if these commercial airliners were falling out of the sky or, or uh, ending up in the, in the wrong destinations all the time, then obviously uh, that would prove that these systems aren't good. But, but, but they're proven over time, proven over a number of years. Uh, and that's why we decided to utilize them in our system. Okay. So three ring laser gyros, three accelerometers. They make up what's called uh, the IMU, which we'll talk about in a minute. But before we do that, let's talk about how they work. Okay, so on the screen here, we've got a basic picture of a ring laser gyro. Okay, so on the picture, we've got this laser here, this laser source. We've got a circuit. In this particular case, it's a triangle. Uh, usually these days they're in a, a square formation, so it's a square circuit where light is sent in two different directions from this laser circuit. Okay, at the far end here you see we've got this readout sensor. So what happens here is that is the two beams of light exit the ring and what they basically do is, is at the detecting end we see uh, if you think of the two, two beams of light as two counter-propagating waves, that's the blue and the green waves in the, in the diagram on the left-hand side here. Okay, so 
if the gyro is stationary, it's not rotating at all, then the two beams of light would be equal. And uh, these two waveforms would be in phase with one another. They'd be overlapping each other. Okay, meaning there's zero rotation. And you can see what's happening here when the peaks and the peaks line up. And when the, uh, when the peaks and the troughs line up, we've also got this other frequency that's, that's uh, appearing called the beak frequency, this, this red frequency. Okay, if you're familiar with the way these, these things work, uh, we're, we're talking about constructive and destructive interference. So basically, you, you're, we're analyzing the interference pattern between these two waveforms, the two counterpropagating waves that are traveling around this ring. And we're, when, when, they're, when they're constructive, we get a peak in the beak frequency. And when they're destructive, it flatlines. And what we're basically saying is, is that we can analyze using that beak frequency, we can analyze the, the amount of rotation for this particular body. So just to put that into, into simple terms is right now, <coughs> the, the two paths for the beam of light are equal because there's no rotation. Okay, so we can assume that, that there would be, uh, they would be both arriving at the same time in phase with one another, which means that there, there, there'd be no beak frequency developed because uh, there's no rotation. Okay, but if we rotated the body and bearing in mind, we rotate the whole thing here. This is the whole, uh, the whole ring is rotating relative to space. Then one of the, one of the paths, for the beam of light is actually having to travel slightly further than the other. Okay, so depending on which way you rotate, one of the wavelengths is shortened, one of the wavelengths is, is extended. Uh, and what you effectively see at the detecting end is a change in the phase, you know, the way, the way these two, uh, uh, the, the interference pattern of these two waveforms. Okay, so what we're basically saying is as we rotate the body, we're going to affect the, the interference pattern, which is uh, directly going to affect this beat frequency that, that exists. Okay, and the beat frequency is basically going to be proportional to the accumulated rotation of the, of the gyro itself. Same if we rotated the other way, we're going to see a difference in that, in that uh, arrival time for each waveform, and that's going to adjust the beat frequency accordingly as well. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Just give me a tick or a thumbs up in the, in the chat. That's the basic principle of a ring laser gyro, is the beat frequency is proportional to the rotation. Good stuff. Okay, seeing ticks and thumbs up, which is nice. Okay, right, what about accelerometers? So this is quite a simple accelerometer, but it's a very good way of explaining the way an accelerometer works. Okay, so what we've got here is a mass on a pivot or a pendulum, if you like, and we've got these two torque coils either side. So when the mass is in the center, with, we're basically saying there's zero rotation and we are applying a stabilizing current in order to keep that mass in the center. Okay, so that'll be, zero, that'll be pretty much zero current effectively, but, it, but it's the null point where the pivot is, is stationary. Okay, the, the mass is stationary. But let's say we got an acceleration in a direction. Look what happens to the, to, to the mass. It swings on the pivot. Uh, the opposite direction to the acceleration because it's a it's a it's a mass on a on a uh, on a on a pendulum. So, in order to keep that mass in the center, we apply a current to these two torque coils. That would push the mass back to the center, and depending on the amount of current that we apply to these torque coils, that is again proportional to the acceleration reading from this from this accelerometer. Same the other way, if we accelerated this way, we would apply the current in order to push the mass back to the center. Okay, but basically we apply a current, whatever that current is reading is proportional to the acceleration reading that we, that we get from these accelerometers. Does that make sense to everyone? Just tick and thumbs up, just, just send, make sure you're following along with that bit as well. Change your thumbs up to ticks if you like. Good stuff. Okay, if you're not happy, or if you've got any further questions, by all means, fire them into the chat and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, 
So as I said earlier, those two systems, the accelerometers and the gyros, they make up what's called the inertial measurement unit. And the, and the thing you saw at the beginning in, in the center, the center picture with the cube formation of all those sensors combined together, that would that is an IMU effectively. So that's an inertial measurement unit, which allows us to provide data for rotation about, you know, the angular rate from the gyros and acceleration along each axis using the accelerometers. So basically we're getting lots and lots of accelerations, angular accelerations and linear accelerations from these two systems. Um, a good way to think about the way these systems work is um, let's imagine I put you in the passenger seat of a car and um, before, we, before we go for a drive I, I show you on a map where we are, I give you a, an idea of where we are on the map, you're, you're then going to uh, basically estimate based on the movement of the vehicle where you think we're going to end up. Okay, so before I take you for the drive, I actually put a blindfold on you. I then take you for a drive for about an hour around, around this, uh, the, the area on the map. And as I accelerate, you get thrown, uh, thrown back in your seat. As I brake, you're thrown forward in your seat. And as I turn left and right, you can sense that movement. Okay, so this inertial measurement unit that we've been talking about, the combination of these accelerometers and gyroscopes, they are actually going to sense um the movement of the vehicle that they're connected to in much much in the same way as you would if you were sat in the passenger seat of a car your 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 sense of balance and all that sort of stuff you're going to be using in order to sense the way that vehicle is moving okay so a good analogy is always always this this type of uh thing once i've finished the the drive you know we're taking taking it for an hour's drive i then show you the map afterwards and you would potentially have a very good idea of where you think we are now based on the movements and the, and the, the things that you've sent. And that is basically what an INS does, is, is it uses its own internal sensors in order to predict its position, next position in time using dead reckoning. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Tick some thumbs up again, please, just to make sure you're following along. Thanks, Asa, yeah. Put yes in the chat as well if you want to. Good stuff. Okay, so the actual definition for an, an, an INS, the way it works, is the proper integration, and that's the mathematical integration, of acceleration into velocity and velocity into a position. Okay, so what we get, what we've talked about so far is, is raw gyroscope signals and raw accelerometer signals. Okay, so initially, the whole system is going to derive some kind of orientation. It's going to, it's going to need to know that it's upright or, or, or where certain things are. Okay, so one thing it, uh, it does initially, as most gyros would do, is, is derive where north is. Okay, so utilizing the gyroscopes and the accelerometers, it's going to have to, uh, in order to derive north, it's going to need to detect other bits of information in order to define that direction. Okay, so what do you think is going to be uh, used by these systems, you know, these accelerometers and these gyros? What, what, what forces are acting upon it now? Or more, uh, more specifically, what, what forces are acting upon you guys sat at your desks right now? Maybe tell me that. Earth's rotation, thanks Adrian. Yeah, so we've got the Earth's rotation. So we are actually accelerating through space. At this particular moment in time what else what other forces are acting upon it or or acting upon us right now gravity excellent okay so earth rotation and gravity hit the nail right on the head there with both of them so these systems are going to be sensitive to both of those those elements okay so the accelerometers specifically the one that's going to be uh that, that's going to be on the axis that's sensitive to down is going to be detecting a gravitational force. Thanks, Bipin. Yeah, gravitational force. Yeah. So the accelerometers are going to be detecting that that pull in the downward direction. Okay. You've also said Earth's rotation. So they're also going to be sensitive to some kind of Earth rotation speed, and the Earth rotates in the easterly direction. Uh, certainly in the northern hemisphere, um, and so 
by knowing where down is from the gravity pull and by knowing where east is, we can determine where north is. Okay. Here's a picture. So what you can see in the picture here is we've got one of our inertial systems. You can see we've got a gravity vector towards the center of the Earth. And what it actually does is, is monitors the systematic change in that gravity vector as the Earth rotates in the easterly direction. So it's monitoring this information and building up a model based on, on uh, what, it's, what it's sensing. Okay, but looking at that picture, what piece of information would be incredibly useful to this thing in order to determine what gravitational aspect to, to, to expect and also what type of rotation to expect? What piece of information can we provide this system with initially so that it, that it, that it starts to, 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 to estimate gravity and Earth's rotation much better? What, what, what can we provide it with? There's a clue on the screen, really, in, in terms of where that system actually is, is set. But what, what piece of information, what single piece of information would we like to give it? Excellent, Adrian. Latitude. Oh, and Asa, yeah. That's, Asa got there first. So latitude, yeah, exactly. So by providing these systems with latitude, we are going to give it an idea of the rotation speed at that particular latitude, but also what type of gravitational component to expect at that particular latitude. Okay, so you may or may not be aware that at the equator, the Earth rotates at about 15 degrees per hour. The further north or the further south you go towards the poles, the less rotation there is. Okay, until you get right at the pole and then there's, there's pretty much zero rotation. Okay, um, but because we've got this latitude, you know, we can position, we can give you the system an idea of where it is on the surface of the Earth effectively and, and it knows what type of rotation to expect and it, and it starts to build up a model for all that all those 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 bits of information okay at the same time it also starts to project all those bits of information into uh, a real world frame okay all we've talked about so far is the fact that we've got these raw sensors we've got these uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers in a what's called an instrument frame okay so that they exist in their own at their own frame but what if we wanted to transfer that knowledge or that information onto a real world frame so we actually know what speed we're actually traveling across the surface of the earth so in order to do that we utilize the same sort of thing we've got this north east down uh, convention so that is effectively going to project all those bits of information into a real world global frame which is north east and down okay because of that we now need to correct for a couple of things okay so we're at this stage here now so once we've once we've converted all the information from from instrument frame to real world frame because we're now in real world frame we need to actually remove those two things that we just talked about Okay, because right now, if we uh, if, if we just sent a, a vehicle across the seabed, across the surface of the Earth, uh, the accelerations that we are reading will be subject to gravity and also Earth's rotation. Okay, so we're effectively adding those bits of information onto our actual acceleration, our vehicle acceleration. But obviously, we're not going to be interested in that. We're actually interested in what the vehicle's acceleration is only not without any other aspects involved okay so the thing we do here is we actually remove the gravitational component and we remove the artifact which which comes from from earth's rotation okay which leaves us with a true vehicle inertial acceleration if you like okay without all those other bits included everybody got that so far just give me a tick or a thumbs up just to make sure you're following because it's a little bit, a little bit uh, more technical, I should say. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay, excellent. Uh, so once we've got this true vehicle in acceleration, we then utilize that, we combine it with an initial velocity. And as I said earlier, the way these systems work is we integrate those accelerations into, into velocity estimates. And then once we've got velocity estimates, we combine those with an initial position and then integrate those into position estimates. 
okay? Which can basically completes the whole process. The, this is obviously now, uh, what, you, what, what you're likely to see now is, is, is the fact that if we've got any errors here in our true inertial acceleration, yeah, which could come from our raw sensors, our gyroscopes, then those incorrect accelerations will be integrated into incorrect velocities estimates. And those incorrect velocity estimates will be integrated further into incorrect position estimates. Okay, so one of the downsides of, a, of an inertial system is obviously the short-term accuracy. Uh, sorry, the long-term accuracy is is not as good as, as some of the other system subsea positioning systems. Okay, because we've got these these sensors that have got by their very nature gyros have a little bit of drift, and if there is any drift in these in these measurements. And we just left this system running, then it would eventually have position estimates that, that have also um, become compromised because of the drift of the inertial sensors. Okay, so what I've just touched on there is uh, the answer to this once given a starting position, the INS will continue to estimate its position by dead reckoning. Okay, so we've talked about dead reckoning, but just bear in mind that, 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 uh, although it's dead reckoning, it's, it's going to keep, keep estimating position. If there is any drift in, in those, uh, those initial sensors, then, then that might have a knock-on effect to your position estimates. Okay. So we're back to this. Uh, just just to, to, to finalize the way these, these things work is, let's say I now took you for a drive for 24 hours. Okay. Did the same thing. I showed you the map, blah, blah, blah. I put a blindfold on you and then took you for a drive for 24 hours. You're gonna get grumpy and hungry, but what you will do by driving for 24 hours and, and utilizing all your, your sensors other than sight is you will get very used to the way that vehicle moves, maneuvers, okay? So uh, the, reason we, the reason I'm telling you that is basically because the longer these INS systems are running, the better they get at predicting their position estimates based on, on, on uh, all their maneuvers and, and things like that, okay? But as we just talked about, will that position estimate remain robust for extended periods of time? There's a question for you. Will it, will it remain robust? A tick or a thumbs up? No, it will drift. Thanks, Adrian. Yep. Yeah. So we kind of just talked about it a little bit, but, but yeah, exactly right. No, it does drift. Okay. So. A good example here, it's very a very simple way of looking at it, but, but, but over here we've got our pirate ship. Let's imagine we're all on a pirate ship with, a, with an INS. Uh, we've also got a GNSS, could be an RTK position feeding us. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to have an INS running with a GNSS feed, but we're also going to maintain monitoring just the GNSS position as well for our, for our surface vessel here. Okay, so we've got GNSS. We're, we're gonna disable the GNSS to the INS, and then we're gonna, we're gonna basically go uh, navigating, if you like. And over time, you'll see that the green line here is the GNSS feed. So that's, the, that's just GNSS feeding the vessel position. So that can act as our truth. And then the red line is our INS uh, solution, but with GNSS, disabled once the system had settled okay but over time you can see the two drift apart the red line has gone into what's called free inertial drift because it's got nothing aiding it okay and the green is obviously where we 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 actually are so that's our truth position so you can see there's a difference between the two and that's because of this drift that we've just talked about all these the, you know the, the, any errors in those gyroscope measurements initially um, is going to have a knock on effect the INS predicted position. So how do we correct for it? Anybody tell me what, what, what have we got available to us? There's a clue on the screen. What have we got, what other systems have we got available to us that's going to allow us to stop this free inertial drift? DVL, thanks, Steve. Yeah, USBL from Mesa, good stuff. What else? We've got DVL, USBL. 
Camel filter helps, but the camel filter needs information from other sources in order to keep it uh, robust. And ex any external position source. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah. Pressure sensor. Good, Steve. Yeah. I think you've got most of them. Okay, so all exactly right. Thanks for that. USBL we've, was mentioned. So we can use USBL to aid our INS system. Okay, in this particular case, that is all we are aiding this INS system with, well, apart from pressure probably. Uh, but let's just imagine we've got just USBL, nothing else. On the, on the graph over here, you can see we've got the blue line. So we give it our system a, a good starting position. But then for the blue line, we disable all our, all our aiding sources and that, that goes into that free inertial drift that we just talked about. Okay, so you can see it's an exponential um, increase. And typically these systems, you can see on the screen here, it's about you know, 12 meters in, in, a, in about four minutes, which is quite a, quite a big drift. Um, that number is incredibly difficult to actually put a perfect uh, number on because it will change. Obviously, the longer these systems are running, the more uh, the, the, the greater integrity they have. So they may actually last a bit longer because they've got uh, more confidence in, in the, the information they have already received. Um, but basically, yeah, it will be quite a quick drift. On the graph, we've also got a USBL, which is the red line. Okay, and you can see here, there's a period of erratic behavior. Could be thruster wash, noise, aeration across the transceiver face. Okay, so the USBL behaves erratically, but the key to, key to this, uh, this picture here is, is the long-term accuracy of the USBL system is actually fairly good. Okay, it's got these periods where it, where it, it skips around a little bit, but overall the long-term accuracy of, of, of the acoustic system is very good okay the green line is our usbl aided ins and you can see it's quite happy all the way through even when the usbl decides to start behaving erratically the ins is still happy until we get to this point here where it starts to respond to what the usbl is doing now, what do you think happens at that point? What does anybody, can anybody tell me what they think has happened? Why does it ride out and ignore the USBL for a period of time, but then starts to respond to it? What, what's happening? Anybody tell me? Just a couple of word answers we'll do. You don't need to give me a full blown uh, analysis of the INS. Changes in the weighting, excellent, Adrian, yeah. Ignoring the false position. Yeah, so it's ignoring it to start off with, they say, yeah. But Adrian's, uh, Adrian's got it pretty close there. Changes, changes in the weighting, okay? So it's not changes in the weighting in real time. Basically what's happening here is, is when we get to this point, when the USBL starts to, 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 to behave erratically, the INS is saying, actually, I'm gonna ignore that for a minute because it hasn't actually sensed that it's moved. Okay, it's, it's gonna continue on its path. So, you know, back to the uh, driving the car, passenger seat of a car analogy that we talked about earlier. Uh, let's imagine you, got, uh, you, were, you were driving along and then somebody said that you were, or, or a position came in that was 20 meters out to the left. Okay, you're gonna ignore that bit of positioning information because you haven't sensed that you've moved 20 meters to the left. So you're gonna ignore it for a period of time, okay? But at the same time, you're actually getting less and less confident in your position estimate, okay? So your uncertainty is increasing, okay? So basically this period of time here, you're, you're, you're quite happy to start off with, but then because you're not getting any other updates from any other uh, positioning system or anything, your confidence is decreasing until this point here where your confidence has decreased that much that you'll believe anything anybody says basically <laughs> okay so uh one of those usb uh, observations uh is gonna closely match the associated error with your position estimate 
And so you're going to lock onto it and say, yeah, I'm quite happy with that. And so you start to respond to the USBL observations. Okay. But you can see how quickly it recovers once the USBL settles down, it does settle down very quickly. So another thing this, this, this drawing shows is, is short-term accuracy of, a, of an INS is very, very good. But the long-term accuracy could potentially be compromised based on, on uh, the, the sensors that are, that are feeding it, but also its own internal sensors drift over time. And the long-term accuracy of an acoustic system is very good, but the short-term, uh, there are short-term um, uh, periods of time with an acoustic system where, where they, they, they're not as good, okay? So by combining these two systems into an aided INS system, we're getting the best of both worlds. We can also use range aiding, or uh, some people would call it LBL, uh, LBL INS or whatever, but, but it, it's not, technically LBL um, aged INS because we're not feeding an LBL derived position to the INS. We're just feeding the range information from that LBL system. And then we're letting the INS come up with its own position estimate based on that range information. Okay, uh, you may see it referred to as sparse array or hybrid navigation as well, um, or sparse LBL. I'm not gonna dwell too long on this, uh, because there is a complete webinar on this next week. Um, but basically, we could utilize the range information from our, from our LBL system as well. Okay, we would need an INS, obviously. But normally, with an LBL system, you wouldn't have an INS. Um, but, but when it's a range-aided INS system, then, then we utilize the range information into the INS itself. And that comes up with its new position estimates. Okay, DVL was mentioned before. So uh, on the screen there, you can see our syrinx. Um, most DVLs will give you what's called a frame velocity, where they've got four transducer beams in contact with the seabed usually, um, and they're measuring the Doppler shift as the, as the body moves forward, or the body that the DVL is attached to as, as that moves forward or in, in whatever direction it's, it's, it's moving. The, uh, the frequency change back at the transducers is uh, proportional to the, to the velocity in that direction. So by having these four beams in contact with the seabed, they can actually uh, record a vector, a velocity vector, if you like. Okay. Um, downside of the oldest type systems is they, they obviously need four beams in contact with the seabed in order to perform that calculation to any high precision. Okay. Uh, so that means you'll get one velocity observation being fed to the INS. Okay, but one thing the Syrinx does that the that most other DVLs I'm aware of don't do is we actually look at individual beam velocities as well. Okay, so rather than just having one velocity uh, vector being calculated, we've got four velocity calculations, which is effectively four individual observations going into the INS every time we take a measurement with, with the system. Okay, so that allows for greater precision. It allows us to tightly integrate much better with, it, with our, with our uh, inertial system. Uh, it's more information for the inertial system and as, as we'll talk about uh, shortly, the more information these systems get, the better they get at, at, at producing positions. Okay. So uh, just if you're not familiar with the, with the Doppler, the way a Doppler works is, is you know, you've got, you got your beams in contact with the seabed. What they actually measure is seabed velocity because they, as far as they're concerned, they're not moving because they're attached to a body. Um, but the calculation is basically they'll get, a, they'll get a velocity in the direction of travel. Okay. Um, we can use pressure sensors for our Z uh positioning okay so obviously uh we've got we've got some systems in our in our raw sensor uh information so we've got our z accelerometers they they'd be measuring our upwards and downwards movement but they would be predicting it based on movement okay so in order to assist them with with that feature in order to position the vehicle in 3d we're going to need to assist them with a pressure sensor of some sort okay just in case you're not <laughs> you're not familiar with with upwards and downwards movement yeah these vehicles do move up and down uh 
throughout the water column. And so uh, in order to, to, to keep their position stable in, in 3D terms, we obviously need the pressure sensor. Which leads us on to uh, the internal uh, algorithms themselves, actually what's in the bottle itself. So we've talked about what's connected to it, but what about what's actually inside? So we talked about the way an INS works, but we haven't actually said what else is inside that bottle that, that allows us to process information. Okay, so here we've got, uh, you can see on the screen, we've got an AHAS processor and an INS processor. So uh, I think, I believe we're still the only manufacturer that, that has two algorithms in one bottle. AHAS is Attitude Heading Reference System, and that will effectively give you heading, pitch, and roll. And INS is um, Inertial Navigation System, obviously, as we've been talking about. So uh, we utilize the AHAS information, the heading, pitch, and roll information in order to feed the INS, but we also utilize the AHAS information as a, as a quality check. For, for heading, pitch, and roll for the INS to compare against. Okay, you can see at the top here, uh, we could utilize this system in, in, in this way where the ROV team simply uses the heading, pitch, and roll feed, and then something like a survey team may take the INS feed for their, for their full positioning. So we could sell this system as an AHAS, or we could, we could uh, uh, sell it as a full INS capable system. which brings us nicely onto our sprint now. Okay, so uh, you saw there, we got pressure sensor and a DVL. We've combined all that information, uh, all those bits and pieces into one. We've mechanically aligned it. We pre-calibrate it for you. And so this is a, this is a system that you can, you can effectively mobilize fairly quickly and it will give you incredibly good performance. Okay, so all, everything's tightly integrated, DVL and beams and, and pressure sensors and all sorts of stuff. So it's all, it's all uh, you know, it's got built-in offsets and everything associated with it. A couple of mobilization picks, just, just so you, you get a context of how these systems are mobilized. Uh, this particular one was on the back of the vehicle because obviously the, uh, a lot of ROVs these days, there's lots and lots of bits and pieces inside. So it's incredibly difficult to, to fit these things in. Uh, you can see how high it is off the back as well. So as long as the beams have got clearance to the seabed, it, it, it's quite, it, it's actually a good thing that, it, that it's that high up because obviously it won't come into contact with the seabed when, when these things um, sit down on the seabed. Okay. Again, another mobilization you can see, again, it's, it's, it's above the skids, so it's not going to get damaged. But if the, if the transducers did get damaged, then they're, they're easily replaceable on these systems. So, um, and they can also cope, uh, they will still navigate with one, one or two of the transducers damage. Okay. Uh, another example there with a through, a through vessel uh, mounted system here. Sound velocity measurements utilized for uh, DVL conversation. And then a nice one here, we've got one that's pointing upwards. So this was for a, a project where they were going to use the DVL to navigate underneath ice. in an upwards direction. All right, everyone happy with that so far? Just give me a tick or a thumbs up to make sure you're all all right with everything. And then we'll move on to how, how the cam and filter side of things works. And then just a few bits and pieces on, on observations. Good stuff. Okay, so let's imagine the box here is the whole system. Let's imagine it's a sprint nav of some sort. We talked about the IMU, which is the raw sensors. That will kick out data to one, uh, 100 to 200 hertz. And you can see here, we've got delta V, delta theta. So our angular rates from our gyros and our accelerations from our accelerometer. We saw the two algorithms earlier, the AHAS and the INS. So the IMU data will initially go into the AHAS, attitude heading reference system. This will derive orientation. It will derive where north is based on that latitude information. And then that will kick out roll pitch, heading and heave usually after about 10 minutes. Okay, so our settling period for this, this system is 10 minutes. Once we've got roll pitch heading in here, we could utilize that as a separate feed, you know, could be for the ROV team potentially, or a surface vessel of some sort. But we also use that information to kick off the INS. Okay, so we've got, we've got roll pitch heading and heave information, orientation information, 
all we need to kick the INS algorithm off is the starting position. And that could come from a USBL hit or a GNSS on the deck or whatever. We then go through all those bits and pieces that we talked about where we're converting it to real world frame, compensating for gravity in Earth's rotation. And then that will effectively integrate the velocities into positions. And then we get these, these position estimates. Okay, so we've got AHAS, INS position. And that will continue to dead reckon, but obviously over time it drifts. Okay, so in order to counteract the drift, we've talked about it. We utilize the addition of uh, external sensors. As the observations come in, they are compared against the INS position estimate. If they agree with the INS position estimate, they get allowed into this error state Kalman filter. Okay, so uh, once they're in here, if you imagine this is a this is a giant matrix or mixing pot of observations. Okay, this is going to refine what's called the error states within the, within this this uh, this matrix, and it will eventually spit out a correction for the position estimate. Okay, so. INS position estimate combined with the increment observations. It fine tunes its position estimate based on the increment observations uh, and the error states associated. And then it spits out this correction and then basically forms a feedback loop. Okay. So uh, what this doesn't do is store the information from these observations. It doesn't, because it, that would be utilizing lots and lots of memory. Uh, it, it, just updates the error states or the, 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 the level of uh, error associated with lots of different relationships based on the observations that it's receiving. Okay. Uh, at the same time, it produces what's called a sensor model. So it's actually starting to model the behavior of these external sensors. And so it can utilize that information to start to reject if any of these start behaving erratically. So let's say our USBL started behaving erratically it would look to its sensor model and its own position estimate, and it would say, hold on a minute, the USBR wasn't actually bouncing around like that a minute ago, so I'm gonna ignore that. So now you can start to see, the longer these systems are running, the better the sensor model becomes, the better the error states become, and so it gets much better at rejecting external feeds, uh, which means it's much more robust. Okay, and that's it. That's the basic principle of the whole thing. Does that make sense to everyone? Give me a tick or a thumbs up or just a yes in the chat. Excellent. Okay, so just another bit of fun quickly. Uh, based on the information I've told you, this time we're going to sit at the kitchen table and we're going to make our way to the bathroom. Okay, so what information as a human being have you got available to you in order to do that? Let's imagine you're blindfolded. You're going to get up from the kitchen table and you're going to make your way to the toilet. What, what bits of information can you use as a human being in order to get yourself to the toilet? Yeah, boundaries, Chris, excellent. Uh, Steve, sorry. Excellent boundaries, yeah. Or, or walls, utilize the walls around you. But what are you gonna balance, Adrian says, that's excellent as well, yes. Yeah? So that's your internal sensors. Touch, good stuff. So when you're touching the walls, hey, so uh, you can't use your eyes because we're blindfolded. So <laughs> you're gonna have to sense your way to the toilet. Um, pretend you're an INS. Uh, so when you're touching the walls, what are you kind of effectively doing? You know how long your arms are. So what can we effectively say that is as a, one of our acoustic systems? What can our arms basically pretend to be? Steve says proximity. Yeah. So proximity comes into it. Yeah. So you know how long your arms are. So what could that be in terms of acoustic systems? You know how long your arm is. So that could be a something that can feed the INS. Not DVL, not filter, something else that we're going to talk about next week in next week's webinar. <laughs> Ranges, yay, excellent. So imagine you know the length of your arms, you know once you touch the wall you know how far away from the wall you are so you can effectively say that's a range from a from a transponder it could be. Okay so we're going to safely navigate our way because we've got lots and lots of bits of information coming into our filter to allow us to navigate our way to the toilet. Okay, good stuff. So just to finish with, why would we use an aided INS? Okay, because one, we can improve 
the performance of our acoustic systems. Okay, you can see here we've got a USBL example. This is a pipeline survey with an ROV. It starts at the top here and goes down and then back up. We've got USBL outliers and we've also got a period of acoustic loss. But if we overlay the INS position, USBL derived INS position, uh, USB laded INS position, I should say. It ignores the outliers because of that, that filtering that we talked about earlier. And it rides through the acoustic loss. But obviously, if this was a, an extended period of time, then it may start to deviate a little bit, like, like we saw in that first graph for USBL. Obviously, if you've got a DVL, then that would obviously maintain position because, as somebody said earlier, weighting would be applied to the DVL for observations and the USBL would be de-weighted in that case. Oops, but you can see uh, this is our standard system, a Sprint 500 survey grade. We can actually start to push the precision limits of our, of our USBL system by utilizing the INS. Okay, so up to four to 10 times improvement in precision. So we're pushing the boundaries of the, of the limitations of our, of our USBL system. So the deeper, the deeper we go with the USBL system, the less precise they get. But let's say we connect an INS to the, to the vehicle that we're trying to track, we could effectively push that precision limit. Um, DVL, just, just without any acoustic systems, let's say the Sprint now, for example, let's again take the, the Sprint 500. You can see we've got a position error here of 0.07% of the distance traveled, which is effectively, if we did a one kilometer trajectory, we can see about a 70 centimeter error at the end of that trajectory. Okay, um, so uh, just using our Doppler uh, INS, we're getting incredibly good performance from our navigation. And this is actually an example that we did in Plymouth. You can see, let's look at the yellow line. We ran for 74 minutes. We traveled 6.4 kilometers. We got a radial of error, error of about 1.7 meters, which is theoretically 0.028% of, of distance travel. Okay, I think there was a couple of uh, transponders at some point down the line as well, but, but basically our DVL INS performance in a straight line is still fairly good. Okay, but as I just said, that is what we would call distance from origin error. So this 0 0.07 that I just talked about for the, for the standard system, 0 0.05 for the higher grade systems uh, and 0 0.12 for the lower systems. That is straight line accuracy, okay? So uh, INSs don't like traveling in a straight line. As we talked about, they like to have uh, heading changes and things like that to feed back into the camera filter. So what we've come up with recently is, is uh, what we'd call typical survey error. So this is DVL INS performance. Because we've got lots of heading changes in a typical survey uh, uh, run line formation here, we can drop that, low, that error right down to about 0.02% of distance traveled, which is phenomenal for these systems. So, you know, we're, we're in, approaching periods of time where we don't need acoustic updates for long periods of time because the DVL INS performance is holding our, our position very well. It's keeping it robust. Okay, uh, sparse LBL, why would you use it? Its main driver is obviously um, a cost saving measure. I don't want to dwell on this too long because we're going to talk about this next week, but basically you can see in the picture here, for a typical pipeline survey, we would have uh, with a full array, we would have full LBL, we would have uh, transponders all the way around. Okay, but you can see in the picture here, we've just got three transponders and they're all on one side of the pipeline. So, um, we can reduce the amount of transponders, we can reduce the calibration time, uh, and that basically reduces the, the overall cost of the project. Okay, so we'll talk about this a bit more next week, so hopefully most of you'll, uh, you'll get onto that, that particular uh, webinar as well. Which brings us quite nicely to the end. Okay, so just to summarize, we can, uh, just why we'd use an INS, an aided INS, we can extend the precision limits of a USBL system. We always maintain a high update rate because the INS is going to kick out of position regardless. We can track a vehicle outside of an LBL array, but that's something that we're going to talk about a bit more next week. We can reduce the line of sight dependency to LBL transponders. 
Okay, if we dip behind the structure, it wouldn't necessarily matter because our INS is going to hold our position for short periods of time. And obviously the big one for particularly this particular, uh, in these circumstances that we're about to be presented with probably, is everybody's going to be looking for cost saving measures. Okay, so cost saving measures associated with, with this technology is, is, is also important. So I just, uh, I can see I've just run over by a couple of minutes, but, but that brings us to the end. So hopefully you understand what an INS does and how it's used. Hopefully you appreciate why we need to aid an INS with other sensors. And then we briefly, briefly at the end there looked at the effects of other sensors on INS performance and also how we can improve these other sensors with an INS. We are uh, in the process of updating all our full courses to, to uh, online uh, capable. So LBL will be online uh, and all our other courses as well. So you can contact us at uh, the email address. You can also get us on LinkedIn. And, uh, so please get in contact if you want more training. But thanks for your time, everybody. Hope stay safe. Uh, hope to see you soon.